This is, we're doing it live. All right. Um, I will get started. Uh, thank you everyone so much for being here. Um, I want to welcome everyone to what I really believe is one of the most important webinars that we've done here at Simplify. And today we're going to talk about burnout. And after getting this ready, I think I'm burnt out. Um, uh, burnout is, of course, a common occurrence uh, uh, among modern day workers. And it's a term you've probably used more than once to uh, describe how you're feeling. But the topic has become particularly prominent of late in cybersecurity. More people are feeling comfortable talking about it, which is great. Uh, and there really are unique circumstances that security professionals, particularly those in the SOC, Security Operations Center, which is our co core audience, experience which can lead to burnout. Um, and it's especially important, as you know, to address burnout because we can ill afford to lose skilled individuals. As it is, we, we, we are experiencing a talent and skill shortage. Uh, Lord knows where we'd be <clears throat> if everyone was burning out. So it's an important topic and, and it's there's a lot to peel away from it and, and, it's, and it's complex and we're gonna try to get to it all over the next hour. Uh, and we're, we look forward to everyone uh, here participating in the Q&A at the end. But let me introduce our, uh, our lineup of panelists. Uh, Carlin Borisenko is an organizational psychologist uh, who is a founder and owner of Zen Workplace. Carlin is the author of the best-selling book, Zen Your Work create ideal work experience through mindful self-mastery, and her writing regularly appears in Forbes. Carlin, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Uh, next, we, uh, we have Amanda Berlin. Amanda is CEO of Mental Health Hackers. If you're not familiar, uh, it's a nonprofit, and they have a presence at shows like DEF CON and such. Uh, the mission, duty, and purpose of Mental Health Hackers is to educate the public, particularly cybersecurity professionals, about the unique mental health risks and problems facing security professionals and other heavy users of technology. And that is certainly all of you all uh, and how to reduce those risks and, and cope with those problems. So she has experience both on the, uh, the kind of the wellness, workplace wellness end of things, as well as uh, she's a cybersecurity professional herself, um, working as senior security architect at Blue Mara, which is a startup. And finally, we have Chris Elliott. Uh, Amanda, say hi to everyone. Sorry about that. Hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, and finally, we have Chris Elliott, who is Senior Manager of Security Operations at Hulu. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Hulu. Chris previously held a similar role at Walt Disney Studios, and every day he draws on his more than two decades of uh, career served, really, in the, in the US Army. And from the physical battlefield to the virtual one, uh, Chris is well versed in burnout and 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 those you know th th that sort of mindset that comes with working in that sort of combat style role uh, on each and every day. So we're happy to have him with us today, Chris. Absolute pleasure to ha to have you here. And also, my girlfriend and I are screening Love Island on Hulu. Uh, so just if you're interested. Uh, thanks for having me. I think it's, I uh, appreciate it. Love Island's great. Uh, watch Dave if you want to get a laugh. Uh, it's on Hulu. I think it's, it's a game changer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We're up to season two now, which is quite the show. Anyway. Um, okay. So let's, uh, so these are our panelists and forgive me for not uh, showing them prior, but uh, here's Carlin, Amanda, and Chris again. Uh, and I'm Dan Kaplan, by the way, I should have introduced myself. I'm director of content here at Simplify, so I'll be moderating the proceedings today. Uh, and what we really want to get to, um, what we hope you'll take away from this is, we want to talk about what makes everyday stress evolve into burnout and how you can identify uh, when it's happening, why the SOC is among the most susceptible places to burnout within an organization. It really is, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, the ramifications of burnout for the security of your business, right? There's there's kind of how it, yeah, it affects you as a person, but also if uh, your if your team and staff are burning out, that's uh, that's certainly no good for the for the ultimate mission, which is cybersecurity, um, and uh, how both employees and leaders can enact steps to mitigate the problem. It's it's really on both uh, sides of the uh, proverbial aisle there, and uh, then we'll talk a little bit at the end about technologies that you can implement. Uh, like security orchestration automation and response SOAR, which is a 
a very popular, much uh, fast growing technology within the security operations center. And it has a lot of uh, usefulness for the problems that, and the challenges that we're gonna be discussing. And, and please like get your questions in as we go along and we'll, we'll reserve some time at the end. I really wanna make this a free flowing uh, discussion. So again, these are our panelists. Uh, so it's an absolute pleasure to have them. And let's dive right into it. And, and you know, I wrote down, there's some questions here, but we'll kind of go a little bit off script, I think, as we, as we get into things. But before we dive into the specifics of, of kind of burnout, I think it's important to define it and explain its rise across all fields. Um, you know, I was someone who I, I think when you, if you said like, oh, I'm in a, I'm in, I have a burnout job, you know, I think doctors, lawyers, but it really is something that can affect uh, all in, all industries um, alike. And it's something that I think is starting to grow more in prevalence uh, uh, each passing year, really. Uh, folks are just, you know, work, in, work it dominates a lot, a lot of one's life. Uh, and it's really something that transcends uh, job types and there's, and there's no easy fix to it. So, Carlin, I want to I want to start with you uh, a little bit about uh, about kind of the concept of burnout. You know, we again, like I said, we throw it around, but uh, there's there's it, 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 there's a certain definition of it. It's not just that you're you're super stressed and you could use a week on the beach and that'll fix everything. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And actually, burnout has become a topic that's uh, received a lot more prevalence than last year, because back in May of last year, the World Health Organization actually took the significant step of adding burnout to its international classifications of diseases. So it is actually right now an officially diagnosable medical condition. Here's what their definition of it is. Burnout is a syndrome conceptualized as resulting from chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. It is characterized by three dimensions. One, feelings of energy depletion or exhaustion. Two, increased mental distance from one's job or feelings of negativism or cynicism related to one's job. And three, reduced professional efficacy. So it's really important to understand that burnout refers to the specific context, uh, uh, specifically to what happens in an occupational context and is not necessarily directed at things outside of work. Wow, okay, so, uh, so and that's interesting, right? So yeah, so burnout is specific to, to the workplace. and. We're seeing this rise. I mean, you, you know, you mentioned that it's being clinically defined now. What do you think is contributing to that? Well, I think it's it's the absolute prevalence of it in our everyday life. I mean, listen, statistics are telling us that uh, about 23% of employees report feeling burnout at work very often or always, with an additional 44% of people reporting feeling it sometimes. So we're getting over up to um, over two thirds of Americans are feeling uh, burnout at work. And it's not just the WHO that's taking the significant step. The American Psychiatric Association, although they have yet to officially add it to their DSM-5, they do actually have a working group on well-being and burnout and are continuing to evaluate it and keep it on their radar. And it's important for businesses to think about too, because I mean, check this out. Burnout costs anywhere between $125 billion and $190 billion in healthcare costs every single year. Okay, so that, that's amazing. Uh, and you wouldn't think it's that much, but what, what ultimately causes that high price tag? Well, ultimately, it's all a result of like any time you feel stress in your head, that is going to manifest itself as physical stress that you feel in your body. So I think a really simple example of this is think about what happens when you have a nightmare. You're in bed asleep and you have this nightmare and maybe someone's chasing you through the woods or something and you wake up and you're sweating and maybe your heart is pounding and maybe your whole body is tense. Now, you just didn't run a 5K, you were laying in bed. But what happened in your head manifests itself as physical symptoms in your body. Now, that's true of a nightmare, but it's also true of stress that we experience in any context. And so when you're talking about uh, feeling very stressed out at work all the time on a really consistent basis, that will manifest itself as sickness in the body. So what they estimate is that workplace stress actually accounts for 8% of national spending costs on healthcare because of the illnesses that it produces. Well, okay. So, so it has, has a real uh, sort of mental ramifications as well as it could lead to you getting physically sick. 
for now. Absolutely. Okay. okay. All right. Well, let's turn our attention a little bit to the cybersecurity industry specifically. Uh, and as I mentioned, no profession is immune to burnout, but we'd be lying if we said information security wasn't really a special case. You know, we've seen stats about, uh, I, I read a recent story how CISOs, the average day for a, for a chief security uh, officer is uh, around 26 months and then they're leaving due to burnout. But, you know, the, the CISOs, uh, the, the executives up top get a lot of, might, might get a lot of the press, but, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of the folks in the trenches, the rank and file working in security day in and day out, going through the grind that are also experiencing this, burn, experiencing this burnout. Uh, so it's a very high stress job. And Amanda, I want to bring you in uh, to talk a little bit about kind of what are some of those unique drivers, uh, unique causes for cybersecurity professionals facing, uh, facing you know, uh, uh, the over, overwhelming amount of stress and, and burnout. Um, and, and, and specific really to the Security Operations Center uh, as well. And, I, and I'm sure it, it all sort of relates and a lot of the things that they're experiencing, but when you're within a SOC, it's kind of its own unique environment. So, so talk to me a little bit, Amanda, if you can, about kind of some of the unique drivers for burnout within this industry. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned CISOs first, right? And that, that uh, short amount of stay that they usually have at an uh, organization. And if you just think about that stress, I mean, that's going to trickle down, right? Um, stress around breaches, notifications, you know, missing notifications, all of the kind of legal, personal, business, political ramifications of when that kind of stuff happens. Um, we're working with such a multitude of technical security debt right now that we're just being forced to catch up. So our people obviously has, haven't scaled as fast as our technology or even our budgets have. Um, and you're right, we, like, we have a major skills shortage when you talk about cybersecurity and kind of tech in general. Um, and I saw that you wanted to do a shameless plug later on, Dan, but I'm going to do one early. <laughs> No worries, um, yeah, yeah, because it's not just the major skill shortage, right? There's, there's uh, a, a lack of automation, a lack of technology to kind of make up for the fact that we can't scale as fast as our technology can. Um, and that's why a company like yours and, you know, that provide automation empower those that are already in the trenches um, and kind of make their jobs a little bit easier and less stressful. Um, that's, I mean, companies like mine as well, we're, we're trying to make, you know, and en empower those, uh, those people that are already working in the field. Um, and, you know, there's, there's really just a, a lot of stuff to cover. Um, and I think that's where a lot of the stress comes from. Um, you know, you think if you're, if you leave this company and go to another one, those stresses are gonna stop, which sometimes, yeah, they do. Depends on you know, who you're working for, right? Um, but uh, they, they can follow you because you know, you're in charge of how you handle it. Handle it. Right, and uh, so, okay, so there's that sort of, you know, again, the, these, these causes, you know, within the, there, there's so many of them really, but this, uh, you know, the skill shortage, the, uh, the constantly need to be on guard, and then specific in the SOC, and uh, Amanda, you wrote, we, we recently put out an ebook uh, on burnout. It's a great comprehensive read, simplified.co slash burnout, and I'll share the link again at the end. But uh, in that, Amanda, you shared some, some information about what the, some of the unique cultural factors that are at play within the SOC. And then, you know, Chris, I'll, I'll bring you in because you're, you're, you're day in and day in on the SOC. But again, it's like uh, you gave three things. One, uh, this perceived uh, lack of, of business value. I think security operations has a tough time uh, getting across their, their overall value to the, to the organization. And maybe that brings people down, frankly, who are working within that space. The emphasis on detail, right? There's so many alerts com coming in. Uh, there's uh, a lot of them are false positives. There's so much noise going on. You have to be so meticulous in what you handle. You're constantly getting bombarded. So there's sort of that, that sort of overwhelming feel uh, that, that, that all that presents. And then, and then it's just like the environment in general, right? And uh, socks. Uh, differ uh, in, in the look and feel of really all of them, but I think the general sort of uh, aesthetic of a sock is one that's not extremely desirable if you want to get your vitamin D, right? A lot of uh, windowless uh, rooms and uh, LED screens, and you're, you're constantly staring at uh, 
at, at that at that stuff. So that's really got to that, that Chris, like when we talk about burnout, like how much of that plays a role? Do you think I mean, again, there's so many drivers. That's why it's so difficult to wrap our heads around this. But but specific to the sock, uh, do, do you think those are, 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 are major drivers? It, it is. It is. Um, you know, we we put people in these rooms. We, we, we put them in close quarters in high stress environments and um, we put them take them out of their comfort level. Um, by nature, most IT folks who are really, you know, they, they we tend to drive people who are introverts into IT because, you know, I find that a lot of people feel, you know, that they don't have to be a customer facing person. Well, introverts also means interacting with your peers. And if you're in a close quarter room with five people and you really don't like that close space, you don't like the discussions, you don't want to be in there, you, you feel like it's all just uh, building on your back. Um, you, you can you slowly feel this burden of not just having to produce and deal with stress, but having to deal with people that you don't want to deal with, having to have discussions you don't want to have. And you start feeling irritable and it's like a splinter that just festers. Um, you know, and as much as we say, get out, and take a walk, sometimes even that walk is doom impending because you feel like, well, I have to go back. Um, and these are things as leaders, we have to be able to uh, recognize and try and put people in their, their space of comfort and, and hopefully drive them to learn how to work in these environments. Yeah. Uh, Carlin, I, I, I read an article and there's been so many articles written about burnout, not specific to cybersecurity, but just that uh, among millennials, there is this uh, real, real feeling of, of the, known as, I think this article labeled them as the burnout generation. And it was, a, a lot of it was related to uh, their, this feeling of this inability to ever complete their, their task list and it, in turn leaving this in, impending feeling of doom. Uh, Chris, I can go back to you, but uh, because I, that's certainly something that I'm sure your, uh, your team faces, but Carlin, let me, let me ask you, is, is that something you think that w w kind of this, this new generation is experiencing burnout. And again, this new generation is who we're gonna be relying on to work in the cybersecurity field, right? Is the new generation of workers experiencing burnout in any different way? Are they more susceptible to it? Well, I think one of the challenges is, is that the, the, um, the finish line for what success look like, looks like is constantly moved. And so what I see in a lot of millennials is they, they think like, oh, if I just achieve this next goal, then I'm going to be happy, then I'm going to be able to relax. And so, I mean, and this starts off from the time they're kids, right? If I just graduate from high school and get into that great college, then I'm going to be successful. And then once they get to the college, if I just graduated at the top of my class, then I'm going to be successful. And then they get out of college. If I just get that next great job, if I just great, get that next great promotion, if I just finish this next great project, then I'm going to be successful and I'm going to be happy. And this keeps people in a constant state of kind of pushing towards that next goal without uh, really fully being present in what they're doing and taking time to be appreciative of what they have. And because they're always pushing forward to that next goal without appreciating the present, that's going to inherently cause them a lot of internal stress. Yeah. Uh, Chris, can you can you relate to that at all? What what are you are are you feeling similar things from your new crop of of of, of sock analysts and such? A hundred percent. It is the the feeling of you know what's my on my task list today? What I need to get to get done? Um, and really, that doesn't exist in the sock. And the second thing is uh, gratitude or even recognition, right? Um, you know, and I'm not going to use the term millennials, but we, we, we find people of this of any age. Um, you know, I'm not going to pick on the, the younger group, but the bottom line is some people need that pat in the back, that, that, that congratulations, you know. Um, and in the SOC, you don't get that. No one ever calls you up and says, you know what, I sent a mail to, an email today and it wasn't, it wasn't taken. I received the email, I wasn't fished. You're never going to get that day-to-day -day recognition and gratitude because keeping the company secure is what is expected and you're not rewarded for it. So a lot of people tend to look, gravitate towards these tasks where they achieve something. And the day-to-day -day in the SOC, the achievement is you, you come into the next day of work. Yeah, so that's interesting. As someone, who, I, I, I know my love language, I took the love language quiz uh, online and uh, words of affirmation, that's important to me, right? And, and, and all that, and maybe, and maybe you, if you're working in a SOC, I'm sure you're giving it to your team, but you're not feeling it kind of overall. And, uh, Amanda, you know, you I mentioned earlier, you mentioned as number one, this perceived lack of, of, of business value, even to the point where, where security might negatively, there's this feeling that it negatively impacts profitability. I'm sure that mindset, though, is starting to shift, right? I mean, breaches happen all the time. People have to believe 
that the security folks working in the organization are important, but yet you, you may think differently or maybe it's not moving as quickly as it needs to. I mean, you'd think that would be the, the change, right? <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it's, it doesn't seem to be that way a whole lot. And, and also like, I, I'm a millennial. So let's start, let's just like start picking on Gen Z or something. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I, you know, with what I do, I, I do uh, software as a service support, you know, and I've worked as, you know, beginning my IT career, I was in help desk. That's the same thing. And you know, nobody's ever, nobody's ever contacted you because of something good. Right. They always just have that negative mindset when they're calling you like, oh, something bad just happened mm -hmm. or, oh, you just did something to cause my work to be more difficult, whatever it may be. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know that uh, a, a lot of times security is perceived as the asset that it is. Yeah. Um, and I, I think another thing, too, with a millennial or whatever not, not even young people, just today's, uh, um, uh, the amount of technology we have, right? So we're, we, we've grown up with just this constant contact of technology and we always have like this supercomputer in our pockets now and we can't disconnect. You know, we talked about being in a windowless room for hours on end staring at a screen. Well, then we could go home and kind of do the same thing. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we're talking about a lot what's going on and probably a lot of people watching and listening are like, yeah, you know, like, of course, that's, you know, that's what it is. So, you know, it is important, I think, that we, that we want to share the, uh, the, you know, the, the actionable strategies and tips. But, you know, it, setting this context, um, you know, it, 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 I think it's an important uh, reminder kind of to, again, some of these unique circumstances that are, that are faced within, you know, within the SOC specifically. And Chris, let me go back to you. Uh, regarding, you know, uh, regarding the SOC, I, I, is there are there things you implement uh, with within within your team? You know, we mentioned okay how it, how you might be perceived within the organization, but the, those environmental factors and the fact that you need to be uh, this this sort of feeling of console overload, and you're in these you know these more sterile environments. What at Hulu? What are you doing to sort of overcome some of those really like the the day to day tangible stuff that you you can like see with your eyes and feel with your fingers that might be leading to to, to folks being like, I can't do it anymore. Well, you know, you, you want to, you want to try and mix it up. You know, if somebody's just staring at Splunk logs all day, um, I, I could, that's unbearable. You know, um, if someone's just looking at thread intelligence feeds all day, it's unbearable. So you want to move people around, kind of change up what they're doing a little bit, get their eyes on something new. Um, but also address what their sweet spots are. What are their skills that they really love and do? And I have a guy who loves threat intelligence. So I'll give him, you know, we have other things to do, but, you know, I make sure that he is engaged in that fashion. Um, the, one of the other things I do is, you know, I really stress that if you're in the office, if we can, let's have in-person meetings. I know that we all can do like we're doing now webinars and WebExes, but let's get in a room together face-to-face -to -face and sit down and talk. And as much as we want to say agendaized meetings, sometimes it's good just to get a meeting and said, what's going on? What are you working on today? What are you working on today? Um, in a very informal manner so that um, as you begin to express what you're working on, you tend to feel you're not alone on your task because someone else will chime in and say, you know what, that thing you're working on, I am also working on a piece of it. Or someone will say, I, I see value in what you're doing. What can I do to help you? Or how can I get some of those results? And you don't feel like you're alone and unafraid trying to do a task by yourself. You actually feel like you're part of a team together. And of course, these non-agendaized meetings also end with, what did you do this weekend? What's going on in your life? Hey, what's this latest news article we're all talking about? Let, you know, and it, it lightens the mood so that you understand that there is a world away from your screen and there are people that are willing to support you and help you. Because sometimes I've I found by having these freestyle meetings, someone will step up and say, you know what? I don't have anything on my plate. Can I help out on this project? And it makes you feel like there's, you're together um, on something. No one wants to feel like they're the only ones tasked with something. And if it fails, it's because they failed. Yeah, that's so important. Uh, uh, Chris, I'll stick with you. What um, do you, uh, burnout is, is probably something that is, is front of mind to you. And, and I know this, you know, we talked, you, you spent, I mentioned uh, many years 
uh, in the military. So you're used to sort of some of those, uh, those battlefield uh, symptoms uh, of, of someone like that might need some additional help, right? Beyond the kind of the, the again, the, that basic everyday stress. So what have you drawn from your time in the military to help you to identify someone within a sock who might be struggling? Um, lucky or unlucky enough, I got to uh, be a participant and a graduate of the US uh, military's three different levels of uh, POW SEER school. Um, pretty, pretty harsh training, pretty realistic training, extremely realistic. But it taught me the value of uh, winning the battle, the small battles versus the war. Um, so instead of, you know, every day you can win in something you do. Um, I always ask my team just a, a blanket term, are we winning today? And I haven't defined win, but what do you think is, can you find something that we did better today? Um, it helps. It, it really helps. So I really talk to my team about, you know, what did you do today? What, what can we do to fix it today? What can we fix in our sphere of influence? What is it that we can affect change in? Don't worry about all the uh, buts and this and this person doesn't have the budget and I don't have the proper tool. What can we do in our sphere of influence to win today for this moment in time? And if you can get enough of those wins every day, you'll look back on your time and feel successful. So I really learned that in the military because, I mean, when you're spending time, you know, I, I spent over four years in combat. Um, different tours. Um, and if, if you tried to chew that up and someone said, you're going to go to Iraq for 365 days, it would, it would crush you. But if you be able to say, I'm going to take it day by day, hour by hour, and I'm going to notch uh, an achievement every day of something. And it might be, I, I, I patched the hole in my roof. I made my bed. I got a thicker blanket, whatever it is, but every day is a win. It makes it bearable. Yeah. So, uh, Carlin, let me ask you, is that something that you believe is, in a, is an effective way to approach feelings of, you know, again, burnout, but even, you know, uh, some other mental health related items? I mean, is that kind of kind of get those small wins? Oh, I mean, I think that it can be. Again, I think that it's really important that we don't keep people in a constant state of striving towards happiness by meeting that next goal. But there is something to be said for um, really building that momentum, really being able to get into flow with projects. I think small wins can help as long as those wins are acknowledged and celebrated. So if you have a win, it doesn't need to be like a big monumental win. Um, if you have even a small win every day, make sure you really take a moment to give yourself a good pat on the back and a appreciate that win. I think that's what really helps. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Amanda, uh, when, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure in your, in your role, you, you're actually, you know what, tell us a little bit, just a, a little bit more, if, if that's okay, just a little bit more about the organization Mental Health Hackers, because, because I think it's sort of emblematic of this growing uh, feeling of, of, folks within the security industry uh, finding new available ways to talk about some things they're struggling with. And, and uh, you know, we're not going to delve into the sort of the, the, the mental health specific uh, topic here, you know, because burnout, we're going to, we're going to stick specifically to burnout and kind of the workplace, uh, uh, the role that it, that, it, that it plays in the workplace. But uh, the cybersecurity industry uh, has suffered some some issues over the past number of years, uh, things like suicide. We lost some some great um, threat researchers uh, to suicide, and you know I don't want to get into everything that uh, what could have caused that, but uh, I think the industry um, has become more uh, open to to talking about these previously uncomfortable topics, right? So um, you, tell us about your organization, sort of where it fits into that, and. And specific to burnout, you're, are, are you are you meeting a lot of people who are suffering from it? Oh, definitely. Yeah, that's that's definitely one of the top top most topics that um, I've heard anyway. And like, um, so our organization in general, like, we're not we don't provide therapy, we don't provide counseling. We're just uh, peer support. Um, so we kind of tell you this is what you should, this is how you should find a counselor, or this is, a, this is how I've dealt with burnout. Um, you know, this is some healthier options that, you know, we've gone about 
So that's kind of our whole purpose. You know, we'll go to conferences and kind of spread the message wherever we can um, and just take all of that awesome information like people like Carlin are doing <laughs> and, and give that to people in InfoSec, right? Because um, I kind of just fell into this role. I, uh, you know, I always tried to care for my own mental health, but then started talking about it. Um, you know, there was a lot of talks already on burnout in the industry. Um, and then we just kind of expounded upon that. Uh, and I, you know, it, it kind of just fit a need, I guess, you know, more people are starting to talk about it now, which is great. That's kind of our, our whole purpose is to kind of try and destigmatize it. Um, and, and let people know that uh, it, it happens to most of us, you know, one way or another, you're going to either know somebody that's had to deal with burnout or something else, or you've experienced it yourself. Yeah, and your organization, uh, I, I was correct in saying that they, that there is some physical presence for it at, at major events and such? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, we actually just, uh, we signed up for another one. We're at, it, it's all on our website, like which ones we're doing, but I think we're scheduled to do 14 events this year already. Um, hopefully none of them get canceled <laughs> with the stuff that's been canceled right. uh, lately, but that's yeah, a whole we, nother yeah. webinar. Yeah, that's a whole nother thing. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, we have just kind of quiet rooms where you can go and learn about different mental health related things, burnout being one of them, obviously, um, and kind of just relax and talk to others that have dealt with, uh, you know, the same things that you're dealing with. Yeah. Uh, Chris, I mentioned earlier how, you know, career longevity is so important in this industry. Uh, is that something you worry about that folks are going to be, you know, just find the work uh, uh, unappealing and not just because they're necessarily bored by it, but because of the, uh, the aforementioned overwhelming nature of it, the, the lack of maybe support, the feeling of always being on guard, all the various things that play into why this is such a unique uh, job field. Um, it, it, it worries me to the point that the pe the same people, the same qualities that I, I personally wanted a great SOC person is that passion, that fire for securing the environment is, is what puts people at risk for burnout. Um, because people are passionate and have that fire. They will take it home with them. They'll be driving home thinking about that vulnerability that's out there, thinking about that unsecured device. They'll wake up in the morning and think about how, you know, they can implement a new firewall rule. Um, that leads to burnout. We as leaders are charged with, with recognizing that and, and, and fixing it um, and, and dealing with those stressors and, and taking as much stress out of the workplace so our employees can thrive. Um, for every employee that burns out, there is a leader that's somewhere in that chain that is responsible because there's signs, there's tools that we could have used, there's discussions that could have occurred in the parking lot. Not about job performance, but about, hey, are you going to the baseball game this weekend? What are your kids doing? How is your wife doing? Um, you know, if we, if we, we as leaders stop looking at people as commodities and more as, as more as resources that are going to embody our companies to do better and treat them as such, um, burnout, burnout it may not be prevented, but it can be, it can definitely be reduced. Um, so as much as we want these passionate qualities, we have to, we have to harvest them and groom them. You know, if you want a dog, you got to take care of it. Um, you know, I mean, that, I mean, that's not saying our employees are dogs, but if, we really want these skills. We have to be willing to deal with the good and bad on it. Yeah. So you're a big, you're a big believer that a lot of this burden rests with the leaders within organizations. And there's a lot of things that you could do. And I think I want to come back to you maybe to hear about some of the specific things that you may do. Uh, Carlin, I know uh, there is, uh, you're a big believer as well that, that the person can, can, can do a lot, I think, to help manage the feelings of burnout, right? So let me ask you that, and then I want to ask you kind of your 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 basic one hundred and one version of 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 that that really can apply to any industry, but is certainly applicable within cybersecurity. So first of all, like when it comes to feeling burnt out, like if someone is feeling like uh, I may be exhibiting some of these symptoms, and again, it's not just your your normal stress, but I feel like I'm breaking down here. Uh, uh, what, what, what do you, first of all, what, what, what should they do? What would you tell them to do? 
Yeah, I, and the very first thing is people have got to take personal responsibility for what they are experiencing. And I, I absolutely believe that managers, bosses, leaders, they do have a role in this as well. They have a role in and an obligation, to, uh, frankly, to create a positive working environment for their team. However, individuals have just as much of a role in making sure that their own mental health and well-being is taken care of. And all too often, and this is another key with the millennial generation, and I think to a lesser extent we see this with Gen Z, at least so far, is they tend to look for other people to solve their problems for them. They say, I feel this way. It must be my boss's fault and my boss has to fix it. There's nothing I can do. That's BS. People have to take responsibility for what they're experiencing. And so um, if I was experiencing burnout, the very first thing I would do is say, okay, let me take a look at my work-life balance. Let me put some better priorities in place to make sure that um, you know I'm not working myself to the bone and I'm taking care of my own personal needs. And that can take a variety of different forms. Maybe it's that you want to make sure you're meditating a little bit every day. Maybe it's that you want to make sure you're getting to the gym before or after work to, to work off some of that energy. Maybe it's that you just want to put boundaries on when you're coming into work and when you're leaving, or you don't want to bring your laptop home at night and continue to do work there. I mean, any number of ways you can get your balance back on track is going to help with burnout. And it doesn't just help because of the specific tactics you choose, it helps because you have made the decision and the commitment to take care of yourself. Do you, and do you recommend, because I think, you know, if, if you say that to some people, you know, like, fine, like, you know, that, that's certainly good advice and, and, and it's on you, I think, to, to uh, make stuff happen for yourself. But uh, some people maybe it, it is the, the question of burnout um, as like a mental health issue. Um, it, cause you know, when you start, when you will burn out, I think a lot of those are, are often aligned. And if, and if burnout is related to a mental health issue, then it might be a situation where like, you can't, you, you can't always blame the person. There might be a deeper issue than just like saying like, okay, I am going to get my butt up at 7am tomorrow and, and go to the gym. Right. So maybe there's something deeper. So do you recommend like talking to someone if you, if you, if you're having these feelings and all that? Well, maybe, but I do think that people underestimate the amount that the, the impact of just these little habits, these little changes can have on our experience. And if fun, when you are making it a, a priority to take care of yourself in whatever way you deem most important, it does fundamentally shift the dynamic and it can have much more of an impact than people think. That's why most of the time, you know, I can give people this advice every day of the week and they don't do it and they wonder why things don't get better. Well, you, you didn't do the things you should be doing. But I mean, you do bring up a good point in that sometimes there can be deeper underlying issues. Now, those issues might not be directly related to causing the burnout, but it certainly is something that they can exacerbate. And for that, you know, maybe you want to work with a coach, maybe you want to go find a therapist. It, there's never anything wrong with asking for help. And when in doubt, be proactive. I mean, I have so many coaching clients that tell me, I wish I had done this years ago. And I even have some that come back after we end our coaching engagement and they come back to me at a later date because they're like, I'm going to be proactive this time. We're getting, we're getting ahead of this. So never be afraid to ask for help. There are so many different forms of help that you can get. And and you just have to find the one that's best for you. Yeah. Okay. And there is a lot of, and some of the things that uh, uh, Carlin was, was, was rattling off there about, you know, meditating, going to the gym, uh, hydrating yourself. I mean, these are all things that maybe sometimes are easy to like forget about or not think can, can infuse, um, uh, it, it can, can play a big role in kind of overcoming feelings of burnout. In the aforementioned uh, burnout guide that we put together, there's loads of those tips. So again, simplify.co slash burnout. You can see those also mentioned in the, in the guide is more security specific, sock specific um, uh, recommendations. Uh, and Chris, let me come to you because actually Amanda was the person who wrote it in this ebook, but I wanna ask you, cause there's a, there's a part about leadership lessons uh, that, she, that she put together and uh, and, and the four big ones are give your team flexibility, make it easier to get help, um, uh, get employee buy-in, and bring in the professionals when needed uh, to assist. And I, again, I think that's, uh, that, that moves a little bit into the mental health category of things. But what are you doing from like a cerebral level, I think, within your organization? Or what does Hulu do to, to make sure that, that folks are, are again, not, are, are not detaching when for, for reasons caused by, by Hulu, right? The work there. You know, um, 
the cerebral part I, I try to do with my is I, I stress the thing of um, I want my employees to be uncomfortable. And what I mean by that is challenged. Um, you know, like I said, if we're doing the same thing every day, that doesn't work. So I try to think of things that will push them out of their boundaries, their comfort zones and get them to work on their technical chops. You know, so if I got someone who I don't think is really good at, at uh, coding, I'll ask them to code something. Uh, I'll, I'll get them involved. You know, I'll get someone involved in SQL. Um, you know, those type of cerebral challenges, I'll ask them questions. I, I don't, I know as much delegate or, or manage as much as ask them questions that are directing them towards what I think the decision is, but really getting people thinking, you know, when we start engaging our minds, um, that's better than just that rote memory uh, task organization we do. Hulu themselves, Hulu as a company is, is brilliant. I mean, there are so many opportunities to get out get some sun, get out, mix with people that uh, have similar likes. You know, there's so many opportunities here to really not just be a workplace, but be a place that you're in, a, a, an environment and, a, and uh, that you're in. Um, I, I commend Hulu on, on some of the, the, the effects they put in. We have meditation rooms, we have Tai Chi sessions, you have video games, you have, I mean, every type of thing to get your mind so you don't feel like you're putting eight hours at work and going home just to repeat eight, uh, 16 hours later. Yeah. Um, uh, so go ahead. No, no, please continue, actually. No, I think it's great that you mix those two because what I've uh, found in our industry specifically, you know, I've never been lucky enough to do the consulting or the remote type of work, but we're starting to gravitate towards these campus-like environments where really the goal is from, I mean, from the leadership is to keep you at work as long as possible. Um, and, I, and I don't see a problem with that as long as you're at work because you're doing something you wanna do. So I have some of my guys will take off in the middle of the day to go to the gym. We have a gym here, they go do a CrossFit session. Some of the guys at 4 p.m. will go take and do um, play a pool game. And I think that's good just to break to get things done. You know, to, to, to really clear your mind and refresh and press that reset button. Because I've also been in those environments where you come in and you do your eight hours and you go home. Um, you know. Yeah, so uh, Amanda, let me ask you. So it sounds like Chris uh, allows quite a bit of flexibility for his team, which is paying dividends. Uh, what I'm sure you're hearing from, and, and again, you know, if you go on Twitter and you spend some time kind of following up some, some workplace stories, you will see that despite how coveted the security professional is, there's a lot of real horror stories happening within businesses um, and I think some people are very blatant about just wanting to like name and shame these employers. You know, at the end of the day, the cybersecurity industry is a, is a, is a tight knit group, right? Uh, people talk and all that stuff. So a lot of, but I'm surprised, Amanda, that a lot of organizations just, just aren't getting it right. Uh, again, that flexibility, those offerings, uh, the way they treat employees. Are you seeing that from the, from the folks who are interacting with your organization that you're, kind of surprised that 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 they're finding such bad workplace environments i think it's getting Toxic, a little if you will. Yeah. yeah definitely um i i think it's getting a little bit better um i i talk to people all the time whether they're leading it or helping or you know just proposing the idea that actually have started um mental health awareness and workplace wellness and all of these kind of healthy mind, healthy body type things within organizations and kind of, you know, uh, pulling back a little on the work, work, work until, you know, you can't anymore kind of mindset. Um, and there's, at, uh, I wanted to mention the one thing, so the, um, uh, that I had found, it's the American Psychiatric uh, Association actually has a website of how to implement a whole bunch of this kind of stuff at an organization. So I try and point that to people all the time. I mean, they, you know, they they don't have everything that everybody's doing, but there's um, uh, places like Johnson and Johnson, EY. Um, uh, what are some of the other big ones? Uh, uh, Bell Canada. Like, there's there's a lot of really good larger organizations that are doing it. Um, I work at a startup, and I've seen more issues sometimes with startups than I have with larger organizations. Um, and that's, I mean, that's just from me talking to, you know, people uh, in the information security community. So, I mean, it could be different in, in tech as a general, in tech general or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, and, and, 
and this is an industry where a lot of people, you know, the people spend some time within an organization and they, and they bounce around. And it's not always because of burnout, just new opportunities arise, yeah. companies get sold and such. Um, but it's important, I think, for, for job hunters to be, to, to be ensuring that they are going to be entering the new place. And again, you know, uh, entering the right place. And I think that people having a conversation, sharing their input is important. Monitoring LinkedIn, uh, you know, reputation will, will ultimately guide you. And I think it's important for people to continue, uh, Amanda, to share uh, information, that, uh, experiences that they've had within workplaces, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's good. I think it'll end up, or at least possibly leading you to a better career opportunity, you know, if your company doesn't really seem to care. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, there's, uh, uh, there are a lot of good companies out there. And I mean, I've, I've tried to get um, people to just start implementing them at their own com uh, own uh, workplaces, you know, because you don't have to wait necessarily. Carlin, a lot of the, uh, th there's a lot of importance for the person to uh, take control of their own situation, uh, but I'm sure you would agree that workplaces could, could do better, uh, some can do better than others, right? What, what do you, what, what's ideal for you to see within a workplace environment to ensure that burnout gets limited? Yeah, the very first thing I would start with, and this almost seems deceptively simple, but workplaces have got to do a much better job of training their managers to understand how to manage their team on a deeply human level. So most of the time people end up in manage, and I think this is particularly true of this type of industry, uh, most of the time people end up in manager positions simply because they proved that they were really good at being an individual contributor, not because they proved they were good at managing a team of individual contributors. And those are two fundamentally separate things. So when we teach managers how to approach each employee as a human being, how to coach them in a way that's going to work best for them, how to provide feedback effectively, how to provide structure so that it actually enhances intrinsic motivation rather than detracts from it, you're going to solve a lot of problems right off the bat. So that's the very first place I would start. And Chris, I'm sure you saw a lot of that need for humanity on the battlefield. So I'm sure you're well versed in connecting with with uh, your employees as fellow human beings. Oh, 100%. Um, you know, I, 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 I think of it as leadership, which is what I was, you know, from the age of uh, 19 on, I understood that's what it meant when you had, uh, you know, you, you were in charge, you were a leader. Um, and that is also understanding that your leadership style will differentiate depending on the type of employee you have. You know, so the motivation, the way you, 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 the way you, you interact, the way you, you provide uh, motivation, where the way you, the way you provide direction will, will differ based on the type of employee you have. Um, I try to impart with my junior leaders that, you know, um, you know, and, and this may be in old and indoctrinated me, but leadership is the definition of, of being able to provide purpose, direction, and motivation. And if you're not providing those three things to your subordinates, you're not leading. I mean, that's just flat out. Yeah. Okay, great stuff. Uh, okay, uh, we are getting to the close to the Q&A session. So I want folks to please send in any questions you have. Uh, they are anonymous. I will just say a person has a question. So don't worry about being called out specifically by name, but please get uh, any questions in uh, that you would like answered. Let's talk a little bit about some of the really tangible, the technology component to all this. Um, Amanda referenced it earlier, and, and I, and I want to get, you know, really everyone's sake, but, but it's certainly especially Amanda and Chris, as this is your field of expertise, but, but automation uh, is, there are technological uh, implementations that can occur that can help to mitigate some of the things that uh, contribute to a SOC team's pain. Uh, among them specifically is automation, you know, and I'll, and I'll be the first to say that Simplify, our company uh, specializes in security orchestration, automation and response, which is a, a technology that is seeing really booming adop adoption within the security operations center uh, to help with effectiveness and efficiency. But I think it really speaks to a lot of the things that burden employees. So uh, Chris, let me ask you, uh, SOAR, Security Orchestration Automation and Response, that's something that, that you utilize at Hulu. And then talk a little bit about that and then just how the importance of technology, right? It's not going to replace people, but it can be a, a mitigating factor. 
Um, you know, SOAR is important because it does, it puts the decision in front of the human that has to make it and gives them a single screen of in, information they need. Um, it, it, it takes out the rep, uh, repetitious things that we have to do and, and automate some of the stuff that I don't want to be woken up at two in the morning. I want to worry about, is the firewall going to get blocked at three in the morning based on this finding? It, 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 it definitely takes a lot, it takes stress off the operator, but puts them in position to make a decision with all the information in front of them. Um, and that's important because what I find a lot of times is risk aversion where it's, I don't want to make a decision because I'm not sure I have all the information or, or I'm not sure this is right. But if you can find a way to present all the information and you performed all the automation that leads them to this point where it's a yes or no decision, they, it, it's less stress on the individual and it frees them up to do more sophisticated tasks. If I can automate all the level one work so that I can give my highly trained and highly paid individuals level two, level three work, that's rewarding. The last thing someone who's got, you know, this awesome skill set wants to do is sit there and manually run patches. I mean, that, that's just that's just demeaning, and they feel like their their value is not being recognized by the company. Right. So that's an important thing. There's the the repetitious, the manual, the menial nature of a lot of SOC analyst work. So there's sort of that aspect to it. Uh, uh, like it's boring, but also just doing that over and over again uh, can result in in this feeling of burnout and underappreciation. So I think that's an important point, getting people to work, uh, to do things that are more inspiring for them, right? That's a, certainly gotta be a, a big way. And Carly, maybe I'll ask you, like that's a big way to probably keep folks engaged within organizations, right? Is, is, is giving them a way, whether, and maybe it's through uh, SOAR and automation technology to, to work on the stuff that is of, 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 of much more interest to them. Well, absolutely. But you also have to understand that you can, through effective coaching of your employees, help them to understand that even if they have to work on things that maybe aren't in, in, as interesting to them intrinsically, but if you can help them align working on those things with, this is going to help you in your career, this is going to help get you to that next step, this is going to help you get a raise, this is going to help you get a promotion, then you can start to help them to get more excited about the things you need them to do. Yeah. Chris, uh, Carlin, might, there's, there's, you're, you might say like, well, there's just so many alerts that are coming into the organization like that are uh, of, of, of similar type. Like there's, there's just a, like my people shouldn't be working on that stuff. But is there some value to having your team uh, work on some of those uh, more tedious tasks, um, at least in some capacity in order to help them grow? Um, I think with, with a large amount of ingested alerts, you want to have correlation. Um, so you can pull that thread and walk it all the way back to what happened. Um, we had a similar thing just in my stock yesterday, which was an innocuous event that when we started pulling the thread out and doing that deeper dive, we were able to find something that was a little more malicious, a little more, you know, re, re, you know basically ended up with us seizing a computer real quick to uh, take a deeper dive. Um, so the tedious stuff is great if it can if if there's a correlation and you're not you're not having too many uh, false positives you're not having too many rabbit holes in your industry. But I will tell you, it's through orchestration and automation that we're able to actually spend more time deciding to go into tedious work. If it's just tedious work because you haven't taken the time to automate, it's kind of a waste. Um, my big thing is if you do it three times, you should have automated it a while ago. Um, yeah. You know, and I think that's that's the big thing. Uh, Amanda, you deal with, uh, again, a, a lot of different folks of, of various uh, disciplines within cybersecurity. Automation is something we're seeing talked about more and more and more as headlining uh, topics at, at conferences, right? Because probably, and one of the big reasons, I think, is that there's just so much to deal with, right? And uh, folks would, would, are getting burnt out dealing with some of the stuff. Yeah, I mean, we... I definitely, definitely agree. We, I mean, we, we're not data entry anymore, right? Like we don't need to do that, that level of tedious work. There's so, so few, uh, you know, store vendors out there and people trying to work automation into their products. Um, like that's why I'm super excited, like with all of the stuff that you guys are doing and what we're doing to just try, the bigger picture is to reduce burnout and and kind of cover that technical debt that we're trying to recover from um 
And, and yeah, I work with all, all different types. And, and there was a question uh, that I saw that kind of relates to this. There's, you know, we, uh, they said we're focusing more on larger sock operations, but we also need to remember like the, the one person sock operation, the one person security team or the, uh, you know, five person IT team that also just generally does security. <laughs> um, all of these kind of automation things are, are definitely, definitely going to help um, them to their day to day, right? Um, you know, they don't have to worry about uh, if, if an alert comes in and they're being scanned from the internet, now I have to go and like block stuff on the firewall and that's going to take time out of this project that I was working on. S simple stuff like that is just should be automated. There's no reason why any, any team, no matter the size, should have to do that manually. Um, and I think that's how we're going to overcome a lot of this technical debt that we already have. Uh, Chris, yeah, because we did see a question. Uh, we have a couple that have come in, but one of those is like a lot of what you're talking about, Chris, is is it's applicable across size of socks, would you say? Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, I think the day and age of a large 30 person sock staring at glass 24 seven is gone. Um, the last two socks I've worked on have been, you know, less than 10 people each. Um, so with that question of, you know, a two person sock, I, I completely feel that pain. I understand what that is. Um, but, you know, that, that's the point is, um, as a leader, can you go to bed knowing you, you performed your due diligence, did the best you can? You know, as a team, did you do the best you can to, and I use a military term, improve your foxhole every day? Um, uh, you know, when you're dealing with a nation state, are you gonna, are, are you, is a two person sock gonna defeat a nation state? If that's what's keeping you up, go to bed. It's okay. There's nothing you can do. What did you do in your due diligence? What did you do in your best effort? Um, automation helps you increase that due diligence, but smaller socks, I mean, they, they're, 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 they're more common than not, I think. Okay, we are running up against time. We had a question come in, and I think this is actually a great way to close, is kind of looking, asking you folks to look forward into the crystal ball a little bit about uh, where the burnout issue, how it's going to um, ultimately end up. Uh, Carlin, uh, do you see any improvement on the horizon? It's kind of a general question, but what, what, what could you see coming? You know, I'm a little cynical in this regard in that I just don't think that, I think we're in this space right now in our society where people are looking for a lot of other, they're looking to blame people for their problems rather than taking personal responsibility and fixing their problems for themselves. That's a pretty universal statement. It doesn't apply to everyone, but I think it applies to an awful lot of people. And so um, until people start taking personal responsibility, we are not going to fix the burnout issue. And I really do hope, um, you know, I, I, I really think 2020 is going to be the year of employee turnover too. We're, we're seeing that as many as 64% of employees may leave their jobs this year. And so maybe organizations will step in and start doing things to really help their employees. But yeah. we'll see. And, and uh, you know, I agree, with, I agree with, with certainly some of that. I do think that there is an importance of uh, seeking help from others and relying on others for help. And Amanda, I'm sure you would agree that, that going and asking for help, especially in an industry like cybersecurity, where I think there is a bit of that tough person mentality that, that, that persists is important. What was the question? <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, no, just asking for help, like admitting okay. like, hey, I need some, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I just it's coming to grips with what's going on and asking for uh, additional help. Yeah, I, uh, that's how I kind of started the whole conversation into mental health and burnout because I went for so long thinking I could deal with it myself. Um, and I feel like a lot of people also do that. Um, there's no shame in talking about it. There's no shame in asking for help. Um, if you can't go and talk to your employers about any mental health issue, um, I think they're probably not a great employer. You should either help work on that or find someone else because it's, it's important. Your mental health is your physical health. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely not something that you should be afraid to talk about or ask for help for. Let's close with Chris. Chris, what do you see going forward? Uh, again, we're talking about burnout. Maybe we wouldn't have been talking about it to this degree just even a few years ago. Uh, how do you see the next several years playing out in regard to it, specific to cybersecurity operations? 
Well, I mean, here in Southern California, we're at like a 0% unemployment rate for cybersecurity professionals. So it's a small pool of people and a large, a large need. Um, we're, we're churning through people left and right. And I think um, at some point you're going to end up, if you're not addressing this burnout problem, you're going to be the, the, you're going to be in the um, musical chairs without a seat. Um, if you're not taking care of your people, if you're not keeping them on the longer term, if you're not growing them and leading them and making them want to come to work, eventually you won't have anybody or you'll have the least skilled, least motivated people to work for you. Um, so I think 2020 for me, what I look at it is how do you grow your workforce, reward your workforce? Uh, how do you treat your workforce? Um, you know, the, the, it, it's, it's a buyer's market. The, the employees have power to move from company to company, whichever company you want to go to. So as a leader, as an, in, as an industry, if you're not taking care of your employees, they will find someone that will take care of them. Yeah. Okay. Great way to end. Um, I want to thank Carlin, Amanda, and Chris. Thank you. This was a delightful conversation. I think we covered so much ground. So thank to all of you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. And, and I'll close with, and, I, and I'll give it another plug. This burnout guide that you're seeing on your screen here, simplify uh, with an e.co slash burnout is the URL for it. Simplify.co slash burnout. Um, if you're doing it on desktop, it's a cool interactive experience. You can even take a quiz to self-assess yourself in terms of your propensity and risk to burnout. So check it out. A lot that we covered, a lot that I reference is in the guide. So this is a it's a great resource to just have at your side, um, whether you're a practitioner, an individual contributor, or you're a team leader like Chris, um, uh, it's gonna be useful for you. So check it out. And maybe we'll get, get the gang back together uh, next year at this time and see, see how everyone feels we're doing a year later. So thanks again to everyone.